Let me introduce myself. So I'm Teresa Wilhelmson and I'm the Utah State Engineer and Director of the Division of Water Rights. And we do have staff here. And to help me present today is also Gary Brimley. And he's sitting right here. He is our regional engineer for our Weber River West Desert Regional Office. And he's gonna present some information as well. So thank you for coming out today. Um, and let me talk just a little bit to give an introduction of why we're here. Um, and also I should say, make sure that if you are here that you sign the sign-in sheet. Um, this is how we are going to note, give you any further notice of any additional information that may be coming. Um, if you're online, because we are recording this and we do have some folks participating online as well. But if you're online, if you just put your name and email address in the chat, um, we'll get you added to the list as well. So, um, so let me just talk about why we're here. Um, so with the current water situation, you know, there's a lot of discussion that's been going on. Um, you know, most of you are hearing with the Gray Salt Lake and conservation and various um, efforts um, to provide funding and additional resources to water. But what we are hoping to bring you today is to present to you the current water rights appropriation policy that affects this area, um, talk about those differences, and then also present to you with some data that um, we have as we're looking at the effectiveness of that policy. We also wanna talk about the governor's proclamation that was issued um, in November um, that restricted new appropriations from this area. And really what we're trying to gather from this public meeting is to get input from the folks within this area because I was directed as part of that proclamation to come back in probably the October interim legislative interim and to the governor with a report that says, is, was that proclamation effective? Um, did it do its intended purpose? And what is the basis if it should continue forward? So that is what we're looking to complete over the next few months. And we're starting with, um, we've done some other areas as well, but this meeting is starting with this area so that we can understand and make sure that we're getting some good public input um, as I prepare that report at the end of the year. So um, we will be seeking about 90 days of public comment and Gary will cover that. Um, but with that, and I'll come back up after Gary is finished and I'm gonna turn it over to Gary now so that he can present some of this information to you about the current policy and some data. So, Gary. Thanks, Teresa. So, I'll just go over briefly the current policy for this area, which includes uh, both surface and groundwater policy implications. And then I have a couple of slides showing some of that data, uh, data about water usage, and existing appropriations, water rights of record. And um, then the governor's proclamation will cover a little bit more in detail what it contained and the proposed policy changes that we may, that we're seeking feedback and input on from the public. And then the next steps and a slide that discusses where, it outlays where we can send your comments. So currently, the water rights policy for the area, and I should put up a map of the area, so I will. Um, this particular slide has a lot of text on it. Surface waters are considered to be fully appropriated. Let's do that, I wanna go to, I wanna go to the next slide so you can see this area. The area is characterized as northern Davis County and western Weber County. It uh, extends as far north as Plain City and Pleasant View, almost, you know, it, it extends to the county line. That's the area we're talking about on the north. The Great Salt Lake on the west, the foothills of the mountain, mountain slopes, the Wasatch Front Range on the east, and the Farmington Centerville city line. So it excludes Centerville and it, it includes Farmington. So that city line between Farmington and Centerville. That's the area. I'll go to the previous slide. The current water rights policy um, 
surface waters are considered to be fully appropriated. That means that appropriations are not accepted on rivers, streams, and other surface sources. A groundwater management plan is currently in place. Um, what that means is we have plan provisions that direct us on how to act on applications and on how to administer diversions and, and uses of water from the groundwater. That plan provides that no new appropriations are approved above the mouths of the canyons. Um, obviously, that's, that above the mouth of the canyons is not really the area that we're focused on tonight. The western area of Weber County is open to limited appropriations of groundwater. And I've put in here that it's subject to the governor's proclamation as of this time. Where a public so water supply is not accessible, individual domestic filings for one acre foot per year have generally been approved, subject to the condition that that well be properly sealed and the water right terminate when a public water system does become available. And applications to appropriate from shallow sources down to 30 feet deep have been allowed. And I use that have been in, in liberal sense. They are allowed. That's the current policy. Exchanges, exchange applications are, I don't want to get into much detail about what they are, but exchange applications have been allowed and are allowed where water is available in the proposed source to be diverted without impairing existing rights. And the exchange requires a release of water under the right being exchanged. Change applications are allowed, and they're considered on their individual merits, which means we approach each application for what they propose with a view toward potential interference with existing rights and ensuring no enlargement of the, the right being changed. We use the term underlying rights. So that right being changed cannot be enlarged. That's the essence of water rights. A little bit more depth of detail on what the groundwater management plan provides. It indicates that diversions from wells in this sub area, it's called a sub area because the east shore area includes more than just the area at issue. This sub area is limited to 90,000 acre feet annually on a moving average, on a five year moving average. And no single year would have diversions exceed 120,000 acre feet. On a later slide, I'll show you what we currently are seeing. New wells must be spaced so that no one well draws down a neighboring well by 15 feet or more. Applications to appropriate are considered on a limited basis. I did indicate all of these three bullet points previously. Domestic filings have been allowed where a public supply is unavailable up to a one acre foot amount. Shallow wells appropriations have been allowed and the volume of water under that provision has not been limited historically. No applications have been approved in areas of critical historical water level declines. I do have another slide showing water level declines. We will look at those wells that have been observation wells. And change applications um, not being allowed into areas of significant declines or at least being critically reviewed for effects on other wells and especially critically reviewed in scenarios involving long distance or areas of significant declines. And those applications converting surface rights to a deep well or shallow rights to a deep well. I do have three slides about showing groundwater level trends. So each of these slides has two graphs. There's a graph showing a well in Plain City and a graph showing a well in the Harrisville area. Each of them, one of them is, each of them was a flowing well. These negative figures at the left of the slide, the, the y-axis, are showing that they are negative below land surface, which means they're above land surface. So these, these wells would have been pressurized or flowing. 
and through the years they've declined and the top graph shows that the water, the water would have been a geyser in this well if it was an uncapped well, 40 feet above ground in the 1950s. And it's diminished to between zero and 10 feet. And the well in Harrisville area, similar story, about 50 feet above ground to about zero to 10 feet nowadays. Uh, a couple of wells in Hooper and Roy. Um, the Hooper well, when it was drilled, it was a flowing well between 10 and 20 feet above ground, and today it is below ground surface. The water level in the well has declined to about 10 feet below the ground surface. The well in Roy, it, is, it never was a flowing well. It started in the 60s about 70 feet down. The water level in the well was about 70 feet down. And today it has arrived at about 110 feet below ground surface. Last, a couple of wells in Clearfield and Kaysville. And I won't go over it in too much detail. You can see the information on the slide. In this one, the Clearfield well, we've seen a decline of about 70 feet, maybe 80. And in the Kaysville well, we've seen a decline of about 40, 40 feet through the years. Yes? So have you seen any trend lines where it's actually moving in the opposite direction, or is this pretty standard what we've been studying? It is very widespread. The declines are widespread. Spread. The answer to your question is yes, there are, some, there are some fluctuations and variabilities and some wells that don't see such sharp declines. I didn't put them up on the slides, but there are some that don't see it. They're so limited that I felt like these, these items I selected give a better characterization of the area broadly. So, so we do see some wells that don't show quite these declines or quite such significant declines, and that may be due to influences with surface water or other movement of water and, and groundwater mounds. And, and I think that those are more limited circumstances than, than what we see generally across the area. This one is a groundwater usage graph. I, I put up the, the current method that the USGS publishes based on data collected by our division. We collect usage data and the USGS compiles it and publishes a, a report of a, a summary statistic. The summary statistic in this area, the Weber Delta area, is that the average annual withdrawal is 32. 7,000 acre feet in the area from groundwater. I put up a gray chart that is the USGS's prior method. And the method, the difference between these two methods is the area of interest, the area being reported. In the first instance, the, in, in, the, in the latest instance from 2018 till now, the area boundary is what we are interested in tonight, which is bounded on the top. I'm trying to move my mouse. I don't know if they'll be able to see it online. The area bounded on the top by the county line, that's that very straight line below or south of Willard Bay. In the prior instance, the, the, the years from 1960 to 2017, they included the Willard Bay area and Brigham City, Perry, and Willard and they included the South Davis County, the, the cities of North Salt Lake, Woods Cross, Bountiful, and Centerville. And so today's method does not include that. The prior figure was 52,000 acre feet, but that included a larger area of interest, and today's figure is 32,500 acre feet. A little bit of broad spectrum data. There are 30 public water suppliers in the East Shore area, 137,000 public water supply connections, a population of 450,000 people. There was 175,000 acre feet of total water use in 2021 
That includes surface and groundwater. Of that figure, only 32,500 acre feet of groundwater usage, as we just saw on the previous slide, and that's annual. So those sources are from water use data collected by the Division of Water Rights and the Open Water Data Portal published by the Division of Water Resources and the USGS information on groundwater conditions in Utah. Existing appropriations in the East Shore area. We have 165,000 acre feet of groundwater water rights perfected of record with a certificate or decree award. Uh, 62,000 acre feet of approved applications and 6, 000, almost 6,700 acre feet rep rep represented or reflected in unapproved applications that have not been processed by our office. Oops. Um, and so this, this figure is an interesting one to put in juxtaposition, which I didn't do on this slide and could have, against that figure of 90,000 acre feet that is allowed under our groundwater management plan on an average five-year rolling average, and the maximum any given single year of 120,000. If all of these groundwater water rights that have been perfected and are of record and the approved water rights together were to be placed to full beneficial use, it would re represent about 227,000 acre feet of potential withdrawals under existing rights. And that 227,000 acre feet is double what the groundwater management plan provisions would allow for. And the state engineer desires to avoid any scenario in which we have to cut off the junior rights and enter into a groundwater regulation situation, which has happened elsewhere in the state. Um, surface water rights, these numbers I think are a little bit less meaningful. They are. They are important because um, there's a lot of water that is reflected in these water right applications and, and, and perfected water rights. And, and when the rivers and surface sources produce this amount of water, those rights would be entitled to take that amount of water. So 884,000 acre feet of perfected water rights in this sub area. 655,000 acre feet of approved applications. The approved applications and that figure 655,000 and the perfected figure of 884,000 both include um, the most junior and largest appropriations which were made by the Bureau of Reclamation and managed by Weber Basin Water Conservancy District. Um, in those couple of very large figures are a few, a couple of very large water rights, one for the Willard Bay Reservoir and one for direct diversions off the Weber River during flood waters to be stored in Willard Bay. So two water rights going into Willard Bay under these very large figures. I guess I will talk to the unapproved applications. There's 9,585 acre feet of unapproved applications that have been filed by various people uh, requesting permission to have a water right and they have not been processed by the state engineer. The Weber River and, and particularly this stretch of it running through the East Shore area, we, we would term it the Lower Weber the Lower Weber River is subject to regulation by the River Commissioner. There is a River Commissioner and, a, and there is a Deputy River Commissioner that is in particular charge of the Lower Weber. The River Commissioner is in charge of the entire Weber from the highest extents up in the Uinta Mountains in, above Oakley. The Lower Weber is subject to regulation and distribution by the State Engineer's Office and the 
slide right here is showing that the regulation made by the river commissioner is in some instances you can see that the date that the water gets cut or called for or or, or turned off is getting sooner. In, in 2019 it was July 12th. In 2020 it moved up to June 19. In 2021 it moved up again to June 1. That was when the river, the river diminishes as the season goes on and the high water rights, the, the river basically enters into kind of a lower flow status and that time of the year that that's been occurring has come sooner you know sooner and sooner with these three years and then it and then it was once again it was back to june 25 which is a little bit later the the calls for cuts to water rights or a curtailment of water rights especially high water rights if it continues to get sooner and sooner, and, 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 and I don't know if maybe four years of data doesn't, doesn't paint a great picture, or it doesn't paint the broad, broad picture of how it might happen, but if it continues to get sooner, it kind of demonstrates that there's an uh, an impetus or a reason or a justification to uh, curtail any additional appropriations, um, particularly with any surface sources. Now, as we've already said, the surface is thought to be fully appropriated. I'm going to move on. I do. Thank you for reminding me. Um, on the Lower Weber, we have been very involved over the last couple of years to try to bring a little bit more data onto our system and not only data but a little bit more of cooperation with the water users on the Lower Weber and uh, that has included um, the river commissioner being more involved with the lower weber diverters and having them install flow meters on their diversion points and just a little bit more of attention paid to these distribution dates so when the river commissioner makes a an announcement and says look i've analyzed the flows in the river today the flows have diminished and declined and these priorities are cut and if a person's priority has been announced to be cut and the river commissioner sees them diverting water he will tag their diversion and they're supposed to cease diverting at that point and there's about almost three dozen of these that we've issued an order to install a flow meter and try to get more participation cooperation from the lower Weber users Moving on to what exactly happened on November 3rd, we received a proclamation from the governor which closed the Great Salt Lake Basin to new appropriations. Um, it had exceptions. So the red outline on this map, it outlines where the proclamation was effective. It was effective in the Bear River Basin, the Weber River Basin, and the Jordan River Basin. So that red outline is quite large. The peach colored area is an area, an area that remained open to limited appropriations under current state engineer policies. And so the peach colored area in the East Shore area, of course, that's where our area of concern is over this meeting tonight. Those exceptions, we've outlined what those exceptions were for the East Shore area. I'm sorry, we, we've outlined what those what the policy provisions have been for the East Shore area. The exceptions in the governor's proclamation 
were for applications for non-consumptive uses, and that means a person might divert water, use it, but not deplete it from the system. They would return 100% of the water diverted, and it would return to the hydrologic system by some point of return, discharge, or injection into the ground. Applications that include mitigation plan to offset depletions. So a mitigation plan, I don't know that we're quite experts on mitigation plans, but it would usually be a water right that brings a consumptive component which is to be retired. And for instance, um, if an appropriation is made and a person retires another water right somewhere, that, that would look like mitigation. Alternatively, a change application on an existing water right that conforms with its historical diversion and depletion limits. Um, there may be other creative ideas about what a mitigation plan might look like, but applications including a mitigation plan were accepted by the governor's proclamation. And applications for small amounts of water as defined in Utah code which comply with current policies. So yes, our current East Shore area has a provision in its policy that allows for small amounts of water to be appropriated. So this proclamation, the intent of the proclamation is to, well, I don't want to necessarily inform the intent or, or necessarily interpret why the proclamation was made, but I am under the perception that it's to help the Great Salt Lake in, you know, in one way and to, to you know, get water down to the Great Salt Lake as, as, as much as possible. And, and so what we're here tonight for is to propose a policy change. The state engineer proposes this policy change. Our area, the Weber Delta sub area, East Shore area, Weber Delta sub area, will be closed to new appropriations, all new appropriations of any size, including small amounts of water. All new appropriations except for those that fail to include a mitigation plan that offsets depletions. So, so I don't know, I mean, I'd love to open it up to any questions at this point. Let me just kind of summarize just a little bit. Are you... If you want to go back to any slide you may. Oh, okay. I might have you navigate to slides. Sure, sure. So, um, Gary really presented a lot of the information that we're seeing um, as far as how over-appropriated um, this basin is on paper. Um, as we look at what the governor's proclamation was, you know, intending to do, we're closing the area to new appropriations. It does seem that the recommendation or the report that I would give at the end of the year is that it's probably appropriate um, to keep the proclamation in place and allow these already approved and perfected rights to develop so that we don't just keep adding um, to the, the number of appropriated um, rights. And then find ourselves, once a lot of them come online, um, really then having to come in and cut back um, some of those junior priorities. And so it seems to make sense in our mind that that's the logical direction or the logical recommendation to make. Um, but we wanted to bring the information to you um, here if you guys have concerns in particular areas or concerns of items that you want us to be aware of and to consider. And so that's where, you know, when Gary asked if there's any questions, we're happy to answer any questions, but this is just what we're seeing based on um, our records and the data that's out there. So, you know, surface water fully appropriated and has been for quite some time. That groundwater, especially the shallow, seems to have a hydrologic connection to the surface water and continuing to appropriate that um, may not be the best. And especially with the additional regulation, you know, 10, 20 years ago on the lower Weber, there really wasn't a need to have to regulate as tightly as we are now 
and requiring a lot more measurement and a lot more reporting because it is becoming more of a scared resource in this um, area. So with that, um, we're happy, happy to take any questions that you may have. I do. I'll, I'll finish out the slideshow. I, I really want to keep the proposed policy change slide up, and I also want to keep the contact us slide up, so I don't know how I'm going to do that. I don't know how I can do two slides at once. So the next, next steps is to receive and evaluate public comment. That means we're here tonight to take comments for sure, absolutely. Oral comments, will they'll be on the recorded meeting. Um, we also want to take your written comments. And so those are very invited, and we'd like to have those come in the door. Um, we will refine this proposed policy, this, this um, ceasing or cessation of, of appropriations. The recommendation to report, I'm sorry. Right, the, the governor's proclamation required the state engineer to prepare a report by November 1st, so in October. and. Um, we want to receive your comments over the next 90 days so that we can incorporate those ideas and concepts or perhaps quote from the comments in the report and, um, and then refine this policy and adopt it. So you can send written comments to our division by mail or by email. Um, just in the mail, put your subject Weber Delta sub area also in your email put that as the subject. And um, so this is the slide I want to leave up. I most want to leave this slide up, but I also wanted to leave up the slide that said the proposed policy is to close the area to appropriations. Let me talk to that just briefly. Closing it to appropriations does not close it off to change applications or exchange applications. If a person has an existing water right or acquires an existing water right by purchase from somebody else, and files a change application or an exchange or a mitigation plan, then they can acquire permission via that application in our office. They can acquire permission to develop water from a different source, changed from a historical source, or for a different use from a historical use. So this proposed policy doesn't curtail change applications or exchanges. It doesn't stop the movement of water around, it just proposes that we stop adding to the outstanding appropriated amount and um, adding to that number and going into the hole beyond what the safe yield of our nature produces. Yes, sir, let's get a mic. We'll, we'll, we'll pass around a mic tonight so that you can be heard. So two things, uh, exchanging surface to groundwater is still okay? Surface to groundwater will still be okay and reviewed on individual merits. So that means if you make a proposal to change a surface water right to groundwater sources, we will undertake review of the application. We will look at the groundwater in the immediate vicinity of the proposed source. We will, in, you know, try. We will see. See. We'll look. Be looking for a hydrologic connection between your surface source and your groundwater. Um, historically, and this is just the way water rights have historically been administered. We don't like long distance changes, so you can't move a water right from. You probably couldn't successfully get a, an approval to move a water right from Plain City to Syracuse because that's a very long distance change application. But yes, short distances and, and, and surface to underground will probably still be acceptable and reviewed on its own merits. Okay, and then um, the data that you showed earlier, was that based on the sunset or del delta aquifers or have yeah. you seen difference in aquifer uh, data? Very good. So the groundwater development data is actually considering all water at all depths from, um, let's say that the data is not confined to any specific aquifer. So it is groundwater at any depth. 
Does that adequately answer that question? Yeah. Okay. We got one, one over here. Would you mind giving an example or two of what non-consumptive use looks like? I don't mind at all. So non-consumptive uses could be um, heat exchange, geothermal, you know, water is diverted from a well, run through pipes and a system and injected back into the ground in another well. The water itself is not consumed. The water for its properties, for its heat properties, is, is being diverted and used and returned to the aquifer. So that's one example. Um, perhaps there could be uh, other examples that are just not coming to mind. Power, power, power generation off of uh, hydropower where, you know, we're, you know not steam generation, but um, the elevation head of the water in a reservoir is being run through turbines and discharged to a river. Sure. There's two examples. And then, I can't remember if it was stated in the, in the presentation, but is there, um, how do I phrase this? In an exchange application, it is case by case, right? And so you will be looking for, um, to prevent sort of any non-consumptive use to consumptive use. Does that make sense that that'll be? Exactly. So, so, so what happens in an exchange is a person presents the state engineer with a proposed plan that says, I've had a water right or I have access to a water right or a contractual right to use a water right. And that, that water right is brought to the table. And a, and a new proposal to use that old water right is made. So I want to drill a well, I want to build a home and use water from a source, and I'm going to relinquish hold of the existing water right. I'm going to release the existing water back to the hydrologic system in exchange for my new project. So it, increasing the consumptive use component or the depletion component of that water right, that historical water right is not allowed. Um, an exchange has to conform to the existing uh, limits of the pr prior water right, the, the water right that is the basis of that exchange. Thank you. Um, maybe this might put Brad on the spot, but... Um, <laughs> as far as planning for Western Weber County, our sources are, of, are a well and then sources from Weber Basin. But to plan for future, how much water is available for planning from the Conservancy District? Um, you're, you know, you're talking about the, the groundwater, but how, how do we plan? How, do, how does a district in Western Weber County make plans? Brad, Brad, do you want to take the mic? So Brad's from Weber Basin. Yeah. And Ryan is from Taylor, Taylor, West, Weber. Taylor West Weber. Yeah. So we are in the stages, opening stages of, of planning for a, um, a new treatment plant out there, right? A study, and initially we'll make 10,000 acre feet available of those surface water for sale. Um, well, I can say for now, but we're planning for eventual development out there. We're just trying to stay ahead of the curve. So, all right, sounds good. Can I ask one question then before I hand it back there? So the, the numbers you kind of put up there were kind of shocking <clears throat> as far as how low the groundwater that's been extracted, 30,000 some odd acre feet, I thought it'd be higher. At those amounts, and with it's supposed to be sustainable of 90,000 in a five-year average and 120,000 max in a year, we're only pulling out 30-some-odd now as a whole, yet we've dropped groundwater levels in the last 70 years, 30-plus feet. Does the division, I hate to even bring it up, plan on looking at the groundwater management plan at some point and eventually all end up with a haircut, for lack of a better term? That, that's a good question for our state engineer. Before she gets to it, can I just mention that the safe yield of the aquifer 
uh, and the figures in the in the safe yield estimate, the 90,000 acre feet safe yield for this aquifer. Be underneath that, that figure, and I'll get I'll let you answer right away. I'll, I'll get to it in a minute. There's discharge seepage out of the ground being lost to evapotranspiration and to the Great Salt Lake to the tune of at least 50,000 acre feet in the report that that figure, that 90,000 acre foot, came from. So that was a USGS report from 1993. I did not put the citation here, but I had it on my computer. And I, I think uh, what I would add is, um, from the state engineer's perspective, um, groundwater management plans are not fun. They're not easy. Um, and they really do change landscape of communities, the landscape of communities, and have really deep impacts. And I think if there is ways um, we have better data, we have more information now, um, we're more nimble with that information, and if there's ways for us to manage the resource better so that we don't have to get to that point, um, I think that should be the ultimate goal. Um, because it, it's a harsh reality when you institute a groundwater management plan and you start cutting. Um, you know, one of the valleys where we have one, one of the major cities has the latest, the most junior water rights in that valley. And that's who will get, take a brunt of the cuts. So um, I think the, the more we can do to be proactive um, about the management of the resource, the better off we're gonna be. And I, I think I would just add also to your question, um, back here, I, I can't remember the name, um, with Taylor West Weber. Um, you know, as with as part of these numbers that we showed, that 165 and the 60,000, those are probably some rights that you guys have. And I think um, if you come into our regional office or call our regional office, we have Gary, Randy is here as well, and then we have Richard. Um, they're happy to sit down with you and say, here's your water rights, here's where you fit, here's your priorities compared to others, and so that you can use that as part of your planning um, as you're developing those systems. And I think that would be very helpful for you to understand. You know, would you be, where would you be if we had to do groundwater cuts, um, priority regulation on groundwater? So, hopefully that address. I, I gave the wrong citation on the technical publication. It, it was Tech Pub number 93, but it was published in The 50,000, yes. So that's really closer to that 90,000 acre feet on an annual basis than the 32 mic. It is. I wish, we had you, I wish we had the mic there for you, but he said that the 50,000 acre feet being lost to nature is, you know, when you add that to the 30,000 that is on average being pumped, that comes much closer to the 90,000 that is available in this in this system's safe yield. You have the mic. So do I understand correctly that um, the 40 year planning horizon that municipalities have uh, will continue to stand, we'll, st we'll still be able to have our master plans look out that far and we won't be cut based on non-use until that time. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, at this time. Yeah, and I, and I think that's a good point that um, as cities are developing, you do develop those 40-year plans. One of the things that may also be informed in those plans are the priority dates and potential for cuts and what does that look like? Um, because maybe there are more rights, senior rights that are needed like from surface. So I think it might change your 40-year plans just a little bit, um, but definitely those 40-year plans are still gonna be needed. And as far as non-use, that is a little bit different term than a curtailment cut, a priority cut, so. Okay. And a uh, follow-up question to that. Let me see if I can re regain my thoughts there. I'll ask it later, I forgot it. <laughs> Did we have any questions on 
If there's no questions online, oh, thank you. Here, let's get the mic right here. To Randy. I'm wondering what will happen with those unapproved applications. Now that we've seen such a large decline, are we gonna, how, how are we gonna review, or are we gonna leave those pending? Or will we, eva will we evaluate them or just? Yeah, um, so wait? I think that we'll just evaluate them on a case-by-case -case basis on their their own merits and see. Some of them may not be able to be approved because they may impair existing water rights, um, but we know that they're there. And I think um, as we know which direction we're moving forward. Um, with the policy, you know, a permanent policy moving forward. What we've done in other basins, when we adopt a policy that closes the basin, we will then look at those that have pre previously been filed. We do have to evaluate them at the, on, under the policy that was in place at the time that they were filed, so they may be approved, and so it may be another 10,000 acre feet of um, deficit that gets built. Um, so we'll take that as we get there. I think our main focus is going to be trying to get a report by the end of the year. And you sound like you have your question. Yeah. If you have your question, go ahead. So okay. you mentioned um, cutting based on priority becoming a poss possibility in groundwater discharge. What types of changes will result in loss of priority to someone who has a 1960, 1860, whatever priority, what change, type of a change application, because you said you will still be considering those, would affect a, a change in priority? So I think the enactment of a groundwater curtailment scenario would potentially come only after the safe yield of the aquifer has been exceeded, perhaps for, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't want to, No, I think, I think what you might be asking, um, so if we have to curtail based on um, groundwater rights, um, based on their priority, which was when they first had the impact to the groundwater, um, it would be just coming down from the most junior rights um, and we would cut fully until we got down to a safe yield. So I, do I understand change applications do not change priority of the right? Yes, so it would be, so, well, it depends on how that impact to the groundwater is determined. So we would have to look at that as an individual case. And now I get what your question is. Yeah, so we would have to look at, did it have an impact? Was there a, a connection? Do we have to do conjunctive management of the surface and groundwater together? And that's a whole nother complication, um, but but you're correct. Can I add? I, I'd like to. I'd, it's not. It's. Um, I'd like to add that um, if a surface to groundwater change is done, which addresses one of the questions that was asked, and and that is done maybe this year, then the priority of that change application is this year, and so that's one of the latest water rights to arrive to the groundwater, and so. If we're regulating groundwater, I think that that would be nuanced. Yeah. nuanced. Yeah. Case by case, it would be case, case by case. So. No, case by case. Yeah. Go ahead. So it was brought up, this area that you have, the growth is going to blow up in the next five to ten years. Now, understanding that water rights have junior and senior applications, but is there something the water districts can do or have do different, being that there is a good chance that they have newer water rights to protect or help proceed the development of this area? Does that make sense, my question? As to like whether cooperative uh, efforts can be made by the water districts and the public water suppliers to plan for that? Right. I mean, if, if our decline is going to continue and there might be a haircut, um, 
how is the Division of Water ready to work with the entities that are issuing the development side and say, listen, the, their water's been haircut. We can't build anymore. Yeah, so, um, so it isn't the state engineer's role to determine local um, development codes or ordinances. That would be at a local level. Um, and that it would be very encouraged that those that are in this area work together um, to figure that out. Um, the state engineer just doesn't have, I don't have any authority to regulate um, what those policies are or to regulate development. So it does come to a local level um, for you guys to do that. So there's a question behind you. Sorry, and, and if you're looking for ways to protect your district from the effects of potential curtailment, you know, in my mind, one way you to do that is to acquire senior rights to add additional buffer to your portfolio. That might be a way that you can take proactive steps in that capacity. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> Where to find them. And, and I guess I just follow up with the question prior. So I feel like as cities, we're getting pressured multiple ways from the state of Utah. And you know, it's water conservation, but then also we're being pressured to develop and add housing components and add all of these different pieces into our communities. And it's really kind of strapping us thin because you know, we're really not able to limit development, limit housing. We're being pressured highly to increase that element. And I don't know if there's any way we could work jointly or, you know, legislatively to, to make some improvements there because, frankly, we're getting two different messages and pulled two different directions that are impossible scenarios. Yeah. No, that's really good feedback. And I think that there are things that you can do. Um, you know, with talking with your representatives in the area, um, House representatives and senators, to let them know the concerns that you have. Um, we don't develop policy, um, they do. We implement the policy that they've developed, but I think that um, at least the interactions that I've had with several of the representatives and senators for this area, they're very open to the feedback and I, they would definitely listen to their constituents. And so I think that's a good thing. Um, one of there are some venues that um, you can participate in um, to try and help um, provide some information. Um, one of those is um, the Executive Water Task Force. It's head up by the Department of Natural Resources, Department of Agriculture and Environmental Quality. And they do have monthly meetings where they talk about different policies and get groups together. Um, but that may be a venue that you can participate in. Another one is um, the watershed councils, and those were set up by the legislature to be able to provide feedback. And so I think there are some um, councils that are set up to kind of help, and I know that's more strain on your resources, right? Um, the limited resources that you may have, but it's so key to have to be participating in those things. So. Um, it's the Executive Water Task Force, and it was established by the Department of Natural Resources Director Styler back several years ago, and it's kind of a big think tank of water professionals um, from attorneys to cities to um, irrigation companies all across the state, and they meet once a month at the Department of Natural Resources our, where our office is. Um, but there is a hybrid meeting, and so you can click on electronically um, to that. And if you want to get added to that list, I'm trying to think the best way to get you connected there. Um, maybe you could just drop us a, com a, a comment, and we'll, we'll figure out how to get that information out to you um, to join there. But it's pretty valuable. There's several folks here that participate in that. I know one of the task force members that votes is here on the front row. Um, so it's just, it's a good venue um, to express your concerns and talk through issues, so. In the possible water haircut, would the public water supplies get any type of priority over any use or? 
No, it's, and that's the hard, one of the harsh realities of the prior appropriation <coughs> system. It's strictly priority, and mm -hmm. the latest rights are the first to cut, be cut. So good, good planning is critical. I just want to clarify, Teresa. So you said on, if, if there is to be a, cur a curtailment of groundwater rights, the junior water right holders, we're not talking about a care cut, we're talking about a scalping, basically. They're, they're done. Yeah. Yes. Okay, as a fairly junior water right holder, we were basing, if our customers are here, you better start perfecting your water rights if that <laughs> ever happens. I mean, if there's like a subsidence issue like it's going on in Woods Cross right now, if that was to happen up here, God forbid, but yeah. okay, I just want to clarify. Yep. And some of the things that the tools that we do put out there, we haven't for this area, but we can definitely work on that um, in the areas where we look at um, these groundwater management areas. We will put up priority lists, which um, basically bring all of those water rights. And you can see from the most senior all the way down um, to the junior user, and then people can kind of see where they fall um, in that line. And that's something that we can work on um, making available for this area. On your haircut of your or your curtailment, do you it's have a scalping? No, you have a scalping. <laughs> no. Okay, curtailment. Curtailment. Um, curtailment. Um, do you already have a plan in place or have a vision of hey, we we see this happening in 20 months or 24 months? No, there there is no plan in place. I think. Um, really what we're seeing is that the data is just seeming to show we probably need to say enough's enough. Let's figure out what we can do with the resource and the water rights that we have now and we shouldn't keep adding to the deficit. Um, and then as more of that development happens, um, we'll see where those impacts occur. You know, and maybe there'll be localized impacts in one particular area, maybe they'll be widespread. Um, it's just really hard to, to say without those rights being developed. Kind of an unknown in a way. Do you have a number in mind you want to share? A number? A number of how many acre feet when we get to this? So the previous study that was done in the 90s, like Gary explained, um, it said it pretty much showed that it's, if we could stay within a five-year average, that 90,000 um, over a five-year average, that we shouldn't be exceeding, but what that's going to do is create greater impacts because that 50,000 that was maybe making it to the lake, that's going to dry up even more as you develop. That's what's going to dry up as more development is occurring. And as we get, you know, with a lot of these areas too, um, sometimes we find we need more data. Um, and so we may have a study that was done back in the 90s or even the 60s or 70s, and we will come in and um, seek cooperate cooperators um, to do additional studies to get more refined data. So you may see us do that over the next decade. Um, it just depends on how much growth and how quickly it happens. So it's nice to have you guys here and answer our questions, so I want to take advantage of it. Uh, with the the 50 acre or 50,000 acre feet, uh, how far how how does that uh, transfer? How far east does it does it transfer? Are we seeing that uh, through aquifer through surface water? And how far east are we seeing that um, that uh, water move from? So the extent of that study was the. The, the gray area on that previous slide that um, I'm sorry not the gray area the green area from the foothills that's how far east to the lake through the ground, yeah. ground. Correct. Through, through the ground it, it, it is it is represent it is groundwater discharges to the west. The groundwater arrives at the west and, and, it, and it arrives in the lake generally and, and, and evapotranspiration to um, plants.
questions? Okay, put your glass ball in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything that's come out of the recent legislature that's gonna affect that Great Salt Lake that's gonna affect our, this area you're talking about that you see? Um, boy, there was definitely a lot of legislation that came out this year. Um, you know, specific to your area, there was nothing that targeted your particular area, but I think that there is some legislation that um, you'll, more information will be coming out. One of those, you know, that they, there was a reuse bill that was passed um, that may have some impacts here that you may want to pay attention to. And maybe I'll say, um, so in a couple weeks here, and I don't know if many folks attend the Water Law Conference in St. George or the Water Users Conference in St. George, but I think there's going to be some um, summaries of a lot of these bills coming out. And then you'll see a lot of us doing this more locally up in this area too, um, to make sure that you're aware. One other one that may be of interest here um, is an ag optimization. It's kind of a future of ag optimization and what that um, may do, and that might have some impacts here. Um, so that could be something to pay attention to as well. There's more um, conservation bills that had, had been passed as well. Um, and then there's a lot of funding that's been um, put in place for secondary metering, this ag optimization program and others for turf buyback and stuff like that. What was that? Was the 200 million approved in the legislature for ag optimization? It was. Yep. Yep, it was. Um, and then Gary also mentioned, which I forgot was our piece, um, it actually did appropriate a lot of funding for us to do better um, water right measurement and reporting and to bring more transparency to the water right records so that you have a better understanding of, of what the impacts are and where the rights are. So um, you'll see us do a lot of that work as well. So any other questions? Uh, yeah, <laughs> so the, the audience that's here said you have to attend the meeting to get the passcode. No. Um, so that's what I just talked to Gary about is that we can create a priority listing and post it for this particular area and we can work on that. It may take us just a little bit of time, um, but we can work on that and get it posted to our website for this meeting page. So it'll, it'll be on the division's website for this meeting is where we'll put it. We may find, an, sometimes our website, you kind of, <laughs> it's not the most clear. Um, we may put it like on our front page for just a, a short period of time, but we'll probably embed it into this meeting page for now. And, and the area, the water right area page. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? So let me, if you had comments that you didn't feel comfortable saying today, um, definitely submit those to us. Um, we do have a mailing address here, but we are in the 21st century. I think you can email them at this point. Um, so do, do email them to us. Um, if there's some concerns that we didn't hear today or you want us to be aware of, um, as we're preparing this report, let us know. Um, as Gary mentioned, um, right now, based on the data, it does look like um, we would recommend that um, further new appropriations cease um, across the board for this area. Um, and that will be part of the report. Um, later this summer, if we feel like there's a need, um, we will come back again, schedule another meeting, just to bring that information back to you. We've got your contacts. If you sign that sheet, we'll make sure you get any additional information. And then those online again, put your name and email in the chat so that we can get the information out to you. So appreciate it for coming out. Um, I love the snow. Um, well, I hate shoveling it, but um, we...
yeah, or driving in it, but we definitely needed um, a good year like we've had. So, um, but I think we need to keep being progressive about managing the area and the resource that we have. So, unless there's other questions, we'll conclude the meeting, and we will be here for a little bit if you have specific questions you want to ask us. But do you have one more? Or no comment. Yeah, so that's the numbers that Gary showed. Um, so of that 220 now, about 65,000 of that haven't been perfected yet, so we don't know. Um, but of that 130 that is that are perfected under certificates or decrees, um, current data for this area, which is the USGS groundwater conditions reports, now that's estimated um, data, but they're showing 32,000. And so where's the other 100,000? We don't know, but it's, it's there on paper. It's just physically not being pumped right now. So, so we'll, we need to keep an eye on that. Hey, thank you. And um, we'll conclude the public meeting. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Mm -hmm.